Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the one minute chart of silver and gold overlaid. So you can see here that you can see that you can't really see the difference. Um, I mean, especially in here and in here that they're overlaid and all the way to there. You can see a little different. You can see the difference coming out now. And of course, uh, silver is more volatile, and you can see that up, down, up, down, up, down. Silver moves. Um, the percentages that silver moves, if you ever want to watch it, you can just do this, especially during the day when it's trading. Silver will bounce back and forth, huge moves. That's We know why that is. But anyway, I just wanted to reemphasize that this is, we know that the, the conclusion is that it's either their monetary metals, both of them, or they're manipulated. There's no other conclusion by this price action. I've explained that before, but I want to get into um, this non-farm payrolls thing. I'm going to start off with uh, a Gregory Manorino. We'll just do a summary with him on this, and I'll stop it real quick here. Uh, I'm going to criticize some people. I'm not, I'm not going to criticize Greg, but one of the reasons why I did the member site, believe it or not, it didn't have anything to do with revenues. It had more to do with lawsuits because... Uh, free speech is already very tenuous in our society and um, you know if I actually come out and say what I think uh, which I'm going to come out and say what I think about a particular Wall Street advisor um, these people have billions they could just destroy me and they could destroy you they can destroy anyone so it's very dangerous that was the main reason to have a member site is to be able to say what I think without having to worry about being sued I've been threatened having my YouTube channel taken down. I've been threatened with lawsuits, all kinds of stuff. So let's start with a summary from Greg. Hi everybody, it's me, Greg Manorino, Hawaii Today. It is Monday, April 6th, 2015. People, before you even get started, let me just say, if you're wondering why I look like this, it's because I have some type of a virus and I am like kind of sick here, but I had to get this out. Um, what is going on here in the market is absolutely well, it's, it's hard to, uh, to define, honestly, but I'm going to try here. Let, let's start with this. Let's go back to Good Friday, just this past Friday when the U.S. equity market was closed. We got an absolutely horrific, abysmal, over-the-top bad uh, jobs report. The, the market was anticipating about 200 and 25,000 jobs. We added about 125,000, give or take just a little bit here. Um, had the U.S. stock market been open on that day, we would have taken quite a plunge. So what happened over this weekend? Well, not too much until today. Today, and this is really where we need to be focusing on, we had right on cue, once again, a Federal Reserve President, this time an absolutely huge gun, William Dudley, uh, came out blowing sunshine up the crack of this market, uh, talking about how the U.S. economy is moving forward here, and also stressing how the Federal Reserve is going to more or less stay out of the way now. Now, if you follow this blog, you absolutely understand what is going on here. And we've seen this over and over again. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. So that's the summary of what happened. Uh, we had another Fed head come out. Now let's take a look and see what happened in the market. Um, everybody was, in fact, I think the futures, I thought I looked at the futures um, last night and I thought the futures were down 150 points. Um, maybe that's this. Uh, let's see, yeah, I, I don't know if the net Danny reflects the futures. But so you can see a move from 17,650 up to 17,940. Um, yeah, so that's that's crazy. Um, but let's let's get some other takes here. I was gonna read the the zero hedge take on it, but I'm just gonna uh, jump over to Mish, and then I'm gonna uh, do uh, Andy Hoffman, and then I'm gonna talk about why I think this is going on. Uh, this is uh, right on cue. Feds Dudley delivers dovish speech. And this is uh, 2 p.m. today from uh, Mish, Global Economic Analysis.
blogspot.com. Futures were negative following Friday's dismal job showing, but that lasted only as long as the market opened. Right on cue came dovish pronouncement from Fed Governor William Dudley in a speech to a New Jersey audience on the regional and national economy. Reuters report rate hike timing now unclear. The timing of the Federal Reserve interest rate hike, which would be its first in nearly a decade, is unclear, and for now, policymakers much watch, must watch that the U.S. economy's surprising recent weakness does not signal a more substantial slowdown, a top Fed official said Monday. New York Fed President William Dudley's comments were the latest sign that a string of disappointing economic data, including a sharp drop in the jobs growth last month, is derailing a Fed plan to tighten monetary policy. And that's the news. I'm not going to read more of that. So let's uh, uh, get Mish's commentary here. In spite of his brighter outlook, which he is now uncertain, Dudley only wants to go from an extremely accommodative monetary policy to one that is slightly less so, precisely the cue the market was seeking. One of these lovey-dovey speeches will be a major sell signal, but the Wall Street salivating dogs won't recognize it when it happens. Perhaps no one will. Mike Mish Shedlock. So let's jump over to Andy Hoffman. Uh, this is uh, the Miles Franklin b blog. And... Um, Let's get to the summary on that. Back to the non-forms payroll report. I didn't have time to go over the gory details yesterday morning, which made it far worse than ever. The ugly headline figures reported, not that I haven't discussed such damning internals for years. However, along with this less watched data, the propagandized headline figure printed at half of expectations, whilst the labor force participation rate hit a new 38-year low and an all-time low for men, all-time for men, all time low labor participation rate, uh, labor force participation rate for men in history. And the weather had nothing to do with it. In other words, the headline numbers were so bad, the horrible internals didn't even matter. And yet they were present as usual, like the fact that as always, the only age category to have registered positive March job growth was the 55 plus senior citizens that can no longer afford retirement and thus take the low paying non-benefit accruing jobs that younger generations so badly need. This is why U.S. entitlement growth is exploding whilst new business and family unit formation is at record lows and consequently why savings and home ownership are at multi-decade lows for the 99% not the privy free Federal Reserve funds and rigged financial markets. Heck, even the inexorable, statistically suspect growth of low-paying, non-benefit accruing waiters and bartenders abruptly collapsed in March, a category, I might add, that was highly questionable in the first place, given how the weakening economy has dramatically impacted demand on both the fast food and mid-tier service restaurant industry. I'm sure high-end restaurants were the 1% diner doing well, but there aren't enough of them to make a dent in the labor force. Of course, all such analysis supposes the reported non-farm payroll numbers are true, which we assure you they are decidedly not. Most likely they are a lot worse and clearly a mosaic of empirical and anecdotal evidence, particularly when expertly interpreted as by John Williams of Shadow Stats, depicts a labor market in depression era condition. Only this time around, more of the so-called jobs are part-time and far fewer people receiving benefits such as health insurance, which I recently deemed a mythical unicorn as has become so rare. Throw in the fact that it's impossible to precisely measure the labor market or GDP, inflation, or factory orders for that matter, in a $15 trillion economy, which frankly could just as easily be deemed a $10 trillion or $20 billion economy, depending on what assumptions and adjustments one makes. And you can see why the non-farm payroll report is a joke and a half to start with. That said, the trend is indisputably weakening and dramatically so, which is why by the advanced weapons of accounting destruction available to the BLS, BEA, and other government book cookers, much less the complete lack of regulatory oversight, the government has been publishing whatever it wants. To that end, consistent with the theme of last year's all economic data are lies, considering 
this horrifying news from yesterday of the Japanese government admitting its published 2014 wage growth figures were a complete sham, or for that matter, the BLS's admission that 69,000 of the so-called jobs initially reported in January and February creating the much better than expected results were used to expand recovery life further and smash precious metal prices, of course, turned out to have been a mistake. And he goes on about the rig data. So I wanted to talk about this non-farm payroll report. And what does this mean? Um, you can We can see it clearly here that uh, there's no question in my mind, in my humble opinion, I am certain that it is the Federal Reserve that is behind the rigging of the stock market, and it is the Federal Reserve that is behind the rigging of the precious metals markets. Let's go ahead and just pull up a gold and uh, Dow cross. This is one I do fairly frequently, but uh, it's important to look at this all the time just to keep an eye on where we are. Um, so that's the weekly. Let's pull up the daily. And that's your that's your divergence there. So what is going on and why? That's going to be the main question. Well, before I talk about that, I want to talk about this story. I've talked about it a lot. I actually did research uh, before I did this video about investment in precious metals as a recommendation of the percentage of your portfolio by Wall Street, quote unquote, Wall Street. Um, and as you know, traditionally, they've said things like, well, they should, the precious metals should be 10% of your portfolio as a, you know, hedge or you should have some protection. Of course, now we have ETFs, we have SLV, we have GLD. These are fake market, fake metals. They're paper metals. They're not real. Uh, and very few financial advisors advise that. So I, I just wanted to give you a sample. This is a guy I hear all the time. Um, he's uh, on the radio. You can you can find him just about anywhere. Uh, let me try to find this here. I'm sorry, I couldn't find it. Okay, so this is Rick Edelman, um, Rice Delman. You'll hear him on AM radio. He's just on all the time. He's just a typical financial advisor. This is just straight Wall Street. And I'm going to read this here. Q&A, add precious metals to the portfolio. You can see this is January 13th, 2015. Question, I have what I consider to be a diversified portfolio, but was wondering whether I should add precious metals to it. If so, what percentage would you recommend? Isn't that good? That's a good question right there. Uh, that kind of puts him on the spot. We're going to see how he squirms out of it. Rick, yes. You should have precious metals in your portfolio, but not because you think that gold is going to double or triple in value, that the economy is going to collapse, or that the dollar is going to become worthless, or that runaway inflation will destroy the nation, thus causing gold to rise to $5,000 an ounce. Hmm, that's kind of scary. Instead, you should own gold, silver, platinum, and other precious metals simply as a diversification tool. We believe in broad-based global diversification and we provide our clients typically with 18 or 19 asset classes and market sectors including precious metals, metals, minerals, non-precious metals, lumbers, commodities, all these belong in a balanced portfolio. Now, uh, you see how he lists precious metals with minerals, non-precious metals, uh, zinc and copper, lumber, and commodities. Do you think these people are taking delivery of lumber? No. So. They're not taking delivery of their metals either. How much of your portfolio should be in precious metals? Not more than 5% usually, because you don't need more than that to achieve diversification. The word correlation plays a part in this. You want to own assets that are not always correlated with each other. In other words, if one asset goes down in value, I would want something else that might go up. Picture a seesaw. Both sides do not rise or fall at the same time. History tells us that stocks, bonds, real estate, precious metals, and commodities are not correlated. Just because one is going up doesn't mean the others are. Owning some of everything helps reduce your overall risk and volatility. Well, doesn't it also reduce your returns? I mean, if you have every asset class that's in the world, then obviously you'll have no return unless there's inflation and then your re real return would be zero. So this doesn't make a lot of sense, but this is the typical Wall Street advice. 
Now, the big question I want to address is why. First of all, why is the Federal Reserve doing what it's doing? Why is the Federal Reserve pumping up stocks? And why is the Federal Reserve suppressing precious metals? Well, I think the reason is that they plan a complete collapse of the system. They plan something like 2008, but this time it's going to be uh, non-bailed out banks. It's going, to re it's going to be a catastrophic collapse of the system. And if you think about it, imagine if you were the person who was planning this thing and you knew that the system that you have is unsustainable, you know that it's going to collapse. You know that you also intend to introduce a new system after this system is replaced. What would be the biggest thing that you're looking for if you're gonna to try to do something like that? One of the biggest things you're looking for is the buy-in into the new system, whether that's uh, IMF, World Bank, who knows, any, who knows what kind of system they might be planning. Uh, digital system, it doesn't matter. Wouldn't you say that the larger number of people that are dependent upon the current system who are completely wiped out by a collapse of that system, the larger percentage of the population that that number is, the more likely you will get unquestioned buy-in when you roll out the new system. That is what I believe is the answer. That is why they don't want people in precious metals. That's why they want people in stocks. Even the precious metals that people buy, they want them in paper precious metals. Because when this system goes down, when the ones and zeros get turned around and the accounts get shut off and the banks get bail-ins and the stock market crashes, and the retirement accounts are confiscated and all of these promises, paper assets, digital assets, the key to this whole thing is the powers that be that are behind this, the Federal Reserve, the world bankers, the bankers and all of their minions, what they want is the largest number of people possible to be harmed by this complete collapse and the least number of people possible to be prepared. Imagine if portfolios were something like every single person had 10% physical silver and 10% physical gold. Just that, which was uh, traditionally uh, recommended. It might have been five and five. At one point it was 10 and 10. Imagine if every person in America had their savings, their retirement, and every, every kind of, uh, investment vehicle they have, five or 10% of that was in physical silver and five or 10% of that was in physical gold. If that were the case, how much buy-in would they get with the complete collapse of the system? It wouldn't be nearly as large as if they wipe out everyone at the exact same time and they tell them, we have to restart the system. Um, this is what it's going to be. If you want to buy into this system, you're going to get this percentage based upon what you had in the old system. Or if you don't accept this new system, you're getting zero. Sorry, that's what we're doing. That is what is behind it all. And we'll talk to you next time.